Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Peter Tucker. I'm the president of the Sports Entertainment Law Society. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to Age Restrictions in Professional Sports. Uh, we're very fortunate today to have Professor McCann with us, uh, who served on Maurice Claret's legal team in uh, Claret's lawsuit against the NFL. And he also has pub recently published a paper entitled Illegal Defense, the Irrational Economics of Banning High School Players from the NBA Draft. I uh, would also like to thank Professor Hagen and Professor Richmond for serving on our panel today. And with, uh, without further ado, we'll turn it over to the panelists. Okay. Um, I'm going to just do a very brief uh, introduction of Professor McCann and uh, also use this as a sort of uh, pedagogical pitch here. Um, and uh, then turn it over to him to present his argument and then uh, Professor Richmond and I will um, comment, engage, um, uh, see if we can get a little discussion going and then open it up um, to the entire group. Uh, I became aware of uh, Professor McCann, what, about a year, a little over a year ago. And um, he did something that I uh, highly recommend to, to law students. He got involved, went in law school with something that really interested him. And instead of just accepting either the received wisdom or um, uh, engaging in a, um, a doctrinal analysis uh, unsupported by um, any kind of underlying data, he actually started to look at what's going on in the market for players what happened to them, uh, and it uh, produced some fairly surprising results, uh, particularly surprising to the sports commentators who found it so surprising that they have continued to ignore everything <laughs> that you found and said. Um, but it, it's just a very, um, I, I think, a wonderful instructive case of what law students can do uh, if they actually uh, sit down and engage the underlying data. Uh, it will be something I think warm uh, will warm Professor Richmond's heart as well. Um, uh, professor McCann is assistant professor at the Mississippi uh, College uh, Mississippi College School of Law. Before that, was a fellow at at Harvard uh, and took his law degree at UVA. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Sure. Thank you, Professor Hagen. Thanks for having me here. I've never been to Duke. This is my first time, and I appreciate all of you people coming out to participate in this symposium. Uh, as Professor Hagen mentioned, about two years ago, actually a little over two, maybe three years ago, I was a law student at the University of Virginia, and in my third year, I took a sports law class taught by Donald Dell, who some of you may remember as the original agent for Michael Jordan, and he also represented Arthur Ashe. He was an adjunct professor at UVA. And during his course, I asked him if I could write a paper. There was usually an exam requirement, but I asked for an exception. And I told him the topic. I said, you know, I recently heard Dick Vitell say that it's a big mistake that these kids are skipping school, in, in Mr. Vitell's words. And I went to look at some of the data just out of curiosity. I wanted to look at the numbers, whether these players have done well or not done well. And I said, you know, it seems as if they've done not only well, but they've done better than other players who have entered the NBA, and uh, Professor Dell said, well, go write a paper on it. And that's where it began. I just started researching some of the underlying empirical evidence about players who skip college altogether and how they compare to those who spend some time in college. And what I discovered was that, one, high school players in the NBA, when you take them in the aggregate, and even when you include players who didn't make it, have averaged more points rebounds and assists than does the average NBA player or the average player of any other age group that's entered the NBA. In fact, they've arguably been the optimal group to enter the league. Now then some will say, well, don't they get in trouble? Aren't they immature? The truth is that, and as I found in a recent smaller study, players who skipped college altogether 
represent a disproportionately low number of players who have been arrested in, in the NBA, whereas those who spent three or four years of college represent a disproportionately high percentage. And you may, you may say, well, wait a second, that doesn't make sense. What about Kobe Bryant, right? Well, one, Kobe Bryant, of course, was not found guilty of anything. Uh, but two, some of the most notorious players in the NBA, Latrell Sprewell, Vernon Maxwell, Reuben Patterson, these guys spent four years of college. So the notion that we're letting in people who are somehow immature or ill-equipped to handle the pressures of the NBA is belied by the data. Of course, the legal question becomes, well, can't the Players Association and the NBA agree to do what they want to do, right? There's, there's a labor exemption that allows pro sports leagues and player unions to negotiate rules on their behalf. And there's certainly a valid argument to that, right? The idea is that if these two groups, presumably rational actors who know the best interests of their own organization, decide to impose an age floor, then that would be in the best, best interests of the players as well. Otherwise, they wouldn't negotiate it. And that's the legal precedent that we have today. We saw that in Maurice Claret's trial, where the NFL and the Players Association elected to negotiate an age floor. Now, there was, I was part of Maurice Claret's legal team, and we believe we had a very valid argument that the age floor was not actually collectively bargained. But I won't get into that because that's a, that's a whole separate topic. But the idea, again, is that courts seem to recognize, at least the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, which is where the Claret case was held, that leagues and associations have some type of authority in negotiating rules that work to the disinterest of players who are not part of the union. Now, of course, you may ask, well, isn't it in the players' association interest perhaps to not let in these young players? Because if you let in these young players who are better, and we've seen evidence that the best players tend to skip school, then they're going to take jobs away from existing players, right? So who's looking out for these people? That's where the law is perhaps missing, is that we have a group of people who are affected by collective bargaining, be it in the NBA or the NFL, and they simply have nobody representing them at the bargaining table. Uh, another common concern that you may have is, well, haven't there been a horde of players skipping college basketball, right? You hear all these guys are skipping school. They're making a tragic decision. Interestingly, from 1994 to, to, to 2004, only 4.4 players per year did it. There wasn't a flood of players skipping college. In fact, it was a remarkably small and self-selected group. And there's a reason why. It's because people don't want to give up full scholarships unless they know that they're going to be drafted high. We've seen a number of players indicate. Sean Livingston, for instance, was a recent high draft pick. He said, I'm not going to go into the NBA draft out of high school unless I know that I'm going to be a top pick. And what happens? He found out that he was going to be a top pick because agents talk to owners and general managers. So there's a tremendous amount of information available to these players before they decide to enter the draft. That's why, during that same time period, approximately 83% of those players were drafted, most of those in the first round of the NBA draft, which means they receive a guaranteed contract. No matter how good they are, no matter how bad they are, no matter whether they blow out their knee in their first practice, they receive a guaranteed contract worth millions of dollars. In contrast, if you look at college underclassmen, they're below 50% of those players who skip college were then drafted. So high school players, again, seem to lend credence to the idea that they know what they're doing before they enter the NBA, that it's small, it's self-selected, and they tend to become terrific players. Now you're saying, well, why would the NBA want to ban them? Well, one again is the idea that the league is selling a product, right? The league believes that fans don't like players skipping college. Now, it's interesting, these same fans apparently don't have a problem with uh, the Olsen twins making $150 million by the time they're 16 years old, or why Jennifer Capriati can skip schooling and become a pro tennis player, or why we have pro boxers, or why we have hockey players skipping college and entering the league immediately. Or even you wonder if the same person were to skip college and go work at McDonald's, whether we would have the same concern for their welfare or if they entered our armed services, whether that we would have the same concern, because they can do that without the same fan fanfare that arises when they decide to skip college to enter the NBA. So it's suggestive of the fact that maybe there's something about us rather than the NBA or the Players Association, right? That we have the data 
that these players have done uniquely well. We have courts saying that leagues and players associations can do what they want. And then we have a group of persons who tend to do extremely well, who are banned from doing so, and who often will elect to go to college, some of, which, some of whom will do very well in college, but others won't. Take a player like Randy Livingston. Does anyone here remember Randy Livingston? Yeah, Randy Livingston, for those of you who don't remember, in the early 1990s, he was a player in Louisiana. He was considered the next Magic Johnson. This was a dynamic young player who, had he entered the NBA draft, would have been a certain lottery pick. But Randy Livingston chose the quote-unquote safe route. He decided to go to college. And before his first practice at LSU, he blew out his knee. For all intents and purposes, that ended the stardom of Randy Livingston. He would eventually make it to the NBA, but his play would be mediocre, and he lost you know, tens of millions of dollars simply because he elected, again, the safe route. Other people will say, well, what about the players that didn't make it to the NBA? You know, you can talk about Kobe and LeBron. You can talk about Kevin Garnett, Jermaine O'Neal, Al Harrington, et cetera. But what about guys like Corleone Young, right? Do any of you remember Corleone Young? Let's take another player. One guy. All right. Well, that's probably, that's, I'm not surprised by that. Usually there are no hands or, or one or two. Corleone Young, very basic high school player, decides to go to the NBA draft in the late 1990s, was a second round pick of the Detroit Pistons. He received about $300,000 to play one year for the Pistons. He was not good at all. He was cut at the end of the year. He then decided to go play pro basketball in Europe. A lot of people said, well, look at this. What a tragedy. Corleone Young, this is, we should not let people skip college. They're making terrible choices, right? Well, Corleone Young still does pretty well for himself. He makes between seventy-five dollars and $150,000 a year playing pro basketball in places like Italy and Greece, Australia, working about nine months of the year, 30 hours a week. In other words, Corleone Young makes substantially more and works considerably less than does the average American or the average college graduate. So why do we consider him a failure? It's an open question. And other people will say, well, what about Taj McDavid? Do any of you remember Taj McDavid? I hope not, because this would be really obscure. OK. Taj McDavid was another high school player who decided to skip college and go for the NBA. He wasn't drafted. And people said, well, look, why are you people telling him to skip college? These guys are making tragic errors. Well, Taj McDavid wasn't recruited by any colleges. Taz, Mc, Taz McDavid wasn't a very good player in high school. So what did he give up? What did he give, right? It was a, I was an intramural basketball player. Had I declared for the NBA draft and I eventually went to Georgetown, I couldn't have played for the Hoyas. Would that have had any effect? Right? No. So there are a number of false examples of players that didn't make it. And again, there are very few players who didn't make it. So when we're looking at the evidence, there's a disconnect, right? There's a disconnect between what we know, and as Professor Hagen said, what people believe. And I also think there's a disconnect between the legal, which is we're going to let players, associations, and owners negotiate rules that preclude access. There's a disconnect between that and the normative. And the normative being, we shouldn't let this happen. We shouldn't simply cite precedent and say, this is the way things are done. We've seen many times in this country, the way things are done are not right. And simply because there's a law in the book doesn't mean it's correct. So I think so, those are some of the bigger issues. And lastly, you know, why are we treating sports associations and owners the same way that we treat assembly line workers at Ford Auto Plants and the Ford management? Right? Why, why do we have the same legal system? One might make a very good argument that we should treat these groups separately. An average NBA player will work four to five years in his life. He'll make millions of dollars in that time. An average Ford auto, assign, uh, auto assembly work, will work probably his whole life, not making not a lot of money. Yet we treat the guy on the assembly line and Kobe Bryant the same. Does that make any sense? I think these are, these are very big questions, right? These are questions that go beyond simply turning to precedent. They go to the question of what is right. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure Ford workers recently are working all their lives. <laughs> <laughs> uh, working as much as Carly. Right. Um, I think if we can do one other introductory thing before we open it up, uh, discussion, I, I think it may be worth uh, setting up the 
legal background on the um, labor exemption and particularly yeah. uh, avoiding the question of whether, in fact, the NFL um, uh, had ever negotiated, uh, collectively bargained for uh, an age limit, um, whether that's, a, in fact, a correct statement of what's going on. We'll leave that to one side. Um, I, I think it'd be worth laying out what the labor exemption is and how it applies here uh, to keep players out. Sure. The labor exemption... Let's go back to unions and, and management negotiating, right? When a union and a management team negotiate a contract, particularly a collective bargaining agreement, the law then changes. The law, they receive what's called the labor exemption. The labor exemption immunizes them from antitrust analysis. And antitrust analysis, to be very broad, is much more scrutinizing than labor law, okay? So the idea is that if the NBA unilaterally imposes a rule, and it's not collectively bargained, then that rule will be judged by various forms of antitrust treatment. There's per se analysis, which is extremely difficult. There's rule of reason analysis. There's also quick look re rule of reason analysis. And essentially, when the law analyzes rules on the basis of antitrust law, they often consider them either presumptive illegal or if they're going to look at the pro-competitive and anti-competitive effects, they're still going to be judged very harshly. So, okay, everyone sees an example of an NBA unilaterally imposing a rule. If the NBA and the Players Association get together and agree to a rule, then the rule will be looked at, in all likelihood, under labor law. And labor law will be exercised in that instance because of the federal, exem federal labor exemption. That, ex again, takes away the antitrust analysis. And what antitrust analysis, again, we're looking at Section 1 of the Sherman Antitrust Act, which looks at group boycotts and restraints of trade. So that's essential. That's a very, very, very brief look at it. But again, when the NBA or any pro sports league unilaterally imposes a rule that arguably restrains trade, the, a court will look at antitrust law and the Sherman Antitrust Act in all likelihood, Section 1 of the Sherman Antitrust Act, which prohibits restraints of trade and group boycotts. And the treatment is very difficult. In contrast, if the NBA and the Players Association neg negotiate the very same rule, the labor exemption will likely apply, meaning antitrust analysis will not be applied. Okay. Um, President Richmond, uh, I'm going to pose um a question, and then you can repose it in any way you okay. want. Um, let, let's take uh, Professor McCann's um, analysis of what the underlying realities are for the NBA as a given. Uh, should that make any difference for the antitrust analysis? And um, uh, then if you want to take up that the challenge that he uh, raised, should antitrust analysis be different by industry, and particularly in industry like professional sports? And to give one little bit, um, was part of, of what Professor McCann was saying, but maybe highlight it. One of the critical things for the players is that if they can get in early, they will get a second uh, if they're good, they'll get a second um, contract in which they are not subject to um, uh, collectively imposed limits on their income. And that's the critical thing that agents are always trying to do, is to get that second uh, negotiated agreement. That's where the real money is. For most players, if they cannot go straight out of high school, they will not get a second contract. Uh, the physical reality is that, that they won't last long enough. Kevin Garnett, it's thought, will earn an extra $100 million over the course of his career simply because he skipped four years of college. And again, as Professor Hagen just said, there's a rookie salary cap when you enter the league. The rookie salary cap pays you, for especially the top players, less than your market value, less than they would get if they were free agents. And that rookie salary cap applies for up to five years, at the conclusion of which the player then has rights to bargain with other teams. So if your career, if you're only going to be able to earn an income typically until you're 32 years old, 
The difference between 18 and 22 is huge, right? It's almost the difference between us working an extra 12 years and us not working those 12 years. So keep that in mind in terms of the economics is that there's an enormous, as Professor Hagen said, an enormous incentive to get to the MBA as soon as possible because your market value will be diminished by the salary cap and you want to get through that cap period as quickly as possible. All right. Um, pleasure to be here. Uh, so uh, the two questions that I, I heard Professor Hagen say essentially is uh, what should antitrust have to say uh, if we assume the facts as given um, and how should antitrust respond particularly for uh, an industry that is, is really quite unique? Well, you know, don't get me wrong. My, my heart goes out to Maurice Claret. I mean, I, he, see, I, I feel like he was slighted. It's really sad. Um, my heart goes out to Terrell Owens, who was, you know, essentially denied. Uh, there was a group boycott against him from playing the second half of the NFL season this year. Um, I'm really sorry that he couldn't play. Uh, so, but here's the question, right? Here's the question. It really is the answer to Professor Higgins' first question. Um, why should I care? And why should any of us care? And, and that's not just, you know acting selfishly. That's, is there something really fundamentally wrong with the system uh, that presents a significant public policy problem? Because after all, our antitrust laws are not for, Aaron, help me out here, they're not for competitors, but they're for competition. That's right. That's right. So, you know, the rules, yeah, that was close enough. That was close enough, the class. Close <laughs> enough right. Um, so, uh, you know, these, rule, these leagues have their rules. The rules favor some people and, you know, disfavor other people. And Maurice Claret was disfavored. And that's too bad. But the question is whether there's a real policy problem here, whether there's a real problem with competition. So what is the competition here? Um, how do we understand the competition? And this really answers uh, Professor Hagen's second question. Should antitrust use generic rules for all industries or should it tailor itself for individual industries? I say it already does tailor itself for individual industries. If you look at the good antitrust opinions, uh, they, they take a significant amount of time understanding how the markets work, the particulars of the industry, the market dynamics, barriers to entry, upfront costs, the nature of demand, all those sorts of things, very, very particular, very nuanced, and then make a judgment as to whether a rule is either pro or anti-competitive. So I think that good antitrust law already does what I think Professor Hagen, Professor McCann want it to do. So how do we apply it here? Um, well, what is the competition? Where is the MBA competing? Now, Professor McCann commits what I call a grievous error, but a very common one in the title of his paper, The Irrational Economics. Um, there are no irrational economics. Uh, maybe there are certain economic decisions that in the long run are uh, disfavorable. Usually that happens for individual behavior, not firm behavior. Sometimes there's economic decisions that are anti-competitive, used to extract certain rents, certain uh, super competitive prices. Um, but we're talking about the NBA here. This is a juggernaut. This is a major league, pardon the term, major league operation. These guys are very smart. They spend a lot of time trying to think about how to maximize their revenue. They are not irrational. Um, so where do they exercise their hyper-rationality? Who are they competing against? Now i got to talk loudly. Um, who are they competing against? They're competing against the NHL. They're competing against Major League Baseball. They're competing against the movies. They are competing for our attention. Um, and that's a market where there is vigorous competition. They might essentially have uh, the pick of the litter. They're top choice as to who they would hire, but that's not where they exercise what you would call oligopoly power, market power. They are trying to figure out how to get everybody's attention and maximize ad revenue, make the most money. And that's a market that I think is pretty rigorous. So with that, uh, and given the sophistication of this operation, are they doing anything that is really uh, anti-social? Socially undesirable. Well, if they're in a competitive market, then antitrust law, and I think most economic policy would suggest, you know, look, let them operate uh, as rational actors. Let them operate within the competitiveness of the market structure and do what they want. 
And if they set a rule that sounds stupid, we can call them stupid and we can let them uh, let their revenues fall. But really, it's not our problem. We shouldn't care about that. If they are denying themselves access to somebody like Sean Livingston for a couple of years, denying them the opportunity to market Sean Livingston for a number of years, and they're losing money because of that, we shouldn't care. I understand Sean Livingston would care, but we don't care. Um, so given that framework, how does antitrust law understand this? Well, there are, as, as Professor McCann said, there are two issues at, at issue here. One is whether antitrust law should apply at all. And the reason it wouldn't is if there were some kind of labor exemption. That's the issue that Professor McCann talked about. That's the issue that the Second Circuit ruled on. And to, to give him and his legal team credit, I reread the, the Second Circuit opinion last night. And I really do think it's wrong. I think that, that on that issue, Professor McCann and Maurice Clerk were correct. However, the issue that I care more, more deeply about is the marketplace, the marketplace for competition whether in fact there's something going on here that is socially undesirable. Uh, and there I think uh, that the legal framework is simply the NBA can operate, do what it does, and if there has to be some, there is a restraint here, Maurice Clark's being kicked out or kept out, but all the NBA has to do is come up with some kind of pro-competitive justification. Why is what they're doing plausibly pro-competitive? And there are three reasons. The first reason uh, is the reason that Chris McCann spends the most time on in his paper, this notion of paternalism. Um, the NBA says that it is better for you, you speaking to Sean Livingston, you speaking to Bill Willoughby, whatever else, um, it is better for you if you wait. Now, Chris McCann comes up with a lot of evidence saying that's not the case. Now, this is really, this I think speaks to the heart of his paper. For him to say that that's incorrect, that it's better off for these NBA players, in fact, to go, or these high school players to go straight to the NBA, you don't just match up the number of Kevin Garnett's with the number of Bill Willoughby's. That's, that's, that tells you nothing. That's not an accurate empirical test. As Chris McCann told him, said himself, the number of players who, high school players who go to the NBA are a very select group. We call that in statistical terms self selection. And by looking at them and evaluating them as a group, that doesn't tell you about the overall efficacy of a role. So what do you do? Uh, you know, the same empirical problem faces people trying to determine the health effects of cigarettes, right? People with, who smoke die earlier than people who don't smoke. Does that mean that cigarettes makes them die? Well, people could be smoking because they're stressed. People could be smoking because their life is hard. People could be smoking because they're overweight and trying to stem off their appetite. There are lots of other intervening explanations that would explain that correlation. Um, of course, cigarettes do make you die, but in order to prove that, you need to have come up with a much more sophisticated empirical test. You really have to figure out what it is that controls, um, that, that likens the two groups, smokers and non-smokers, high school players who go to college versus high school players who go to the MBA. Um, you have to come up with a, a list of control variables, with probably uh, with instrumental variables, and understand exactly what it is that explains differences in performance outside of the obvious category that separates them. Now, this is hard. Most lawyers think that, you know, kind of get tired and exasperated when an empiricist says, no, you have to come up with a much more sophisticated test. But that's what you got to do. If you're going to make an empirical claim, this is the rigor that you need to really support that claim. So. I suspect that Professor McCann might be right in this case, but the evidence that he comes up for us really is only the beginning. So what's the second explanation? The second explanation for why the NBA might plausibly defend this rule is what you could call an externality. And this I got only two nights ago. I was watching The Daily Show, which is where I get all my news. And, and who was the visitor? Did you guys see this, by the way? Uh, Charles Barkley. Barkley. Bar yeah. Sir Charles, my favorite. And uh, John Stewart asked uh, Charles Barkley, so why do the Knicks stink? And Charles said, it's because they're too young. Now, I understand they have a tremendous amount of talent, uh, and the Knicks management shouldn't be faulted for trying to tap this early talent. You know, next year, the year after, the year after that, this team might be a playoff team. Um, but that's why they stink now. Now, think about this. How much money is the NBA losing by having 
a bad team in the nation's biggest market. And that is an externality. That is a cost that the Knicks are imposing on the rest of the NBA. It's perfectly plausible, perfectly reasonable for why the NBA would want to come up with a rule that would prevent any one team from investing too much in its future at the expense of its, at the expense of its present. That would be a long-term profit-maximizing strategy that the NBA would want to go. Is this the rule that the league should ensure that Isaiah Thomas does not right. <laughs> operate the Knicks? Is it, yeah, there are, lot, there, there are lots of rules. Also, yeah. the, the rule that yeah, Larry Brown should only coach players who are older than 27. I mean, there, there, there are lots of alternative explanations here. I'm just talking, I'm talking about Charles Barkley's explanation. Do and Charles the got is great. the first pick and to get Patrick Ewing? I mean, is this sort of the same? We need to make the Knicks better. Patrick went to college for four years. Right. He was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, he, he went to the right college. So reason number three, reason number three simply, why would it be plausibly pro-competitive, plausibly justifiable for why the, why the NBA would want to do this? And that third is marketing. I mean, Professor McCann talked about how stupid the fans are, how fickle they are. Why would they ever care about the age of an NBA player and not care about the age of an ice dancer? I don't know. But if the NBA seems to think that they do, and again, they're very sophisticated in determining this stuff, then why would we want to restrain the NBA from pursuing their profit-maximizing strategy? So the, 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 the populace might be stupid, NBA fans might be stupid, but the NBA is not stupid. Uh, and to restrain them, you really need to come up with a very effective reason for why somehow or another the marketplace of competition is being restrained. So that's a long-winded answer of saying why uh, antitrust does look at does look at uh, sports leagues very differently in a very particular way. And the way that antitrust law should look at this, I think, would really suggest that there should be uh, a simple rule of reason analysis here. The restraint is perfectly pro-competitive. That's what the NBA wants to do. They should be allowed to do it. Uh, it just This is a clarification for me. Uh, you're junking the non-statutory labor exemption, which is clearly what the NBA... Yeah, I, I chose I, to hang everything on, and um, yeah, no, 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 no. One, I mean, I, I would, I would, I would normally jump whole hog and say yes, I'm, I am junking that. Uh, I've put a lot less thought into that issue than the other issue. Okay. I'm much, much less of an expert in the uh, the issue of labor exemption than uh, overall market structure. Having said that, you know, I, I looked at the Second Circuit opinion. It didn't seem to make sense to me. I think that there should be some significant scrutiny, or at least there should not be an exemption for a situation where you have a union who is representing essentially its future members, or really representing or making rules for people who will threaten its current members. I think that that should receive scrutiny. That's good. Uh, what I'd like to do is have uh, Professor McCann respond uh, and uh, then open this up. Well, first off, I agree with your opinion about the Second Circuit's opinion. <laughs> we can certainly find common ground on that. Uh, in terms of paternalism, and the lack of, of other data, I think one is that we have what we have, right? Is that the fact that there are so few NBA players who skip college is, is to me, is implicitly suggestive of the fact that not a lot of players are doing it, one, and that we shouldn't expect that there would be a flood of players doing so. I think if we were to have a flood of players skipping, the M skipping college, then I wouldn't have written the article, right? The idea is that these players probably wouldn't have been as good in the aggregate. So the fact that there are so few actors, um, to me, is suggestive of their strength rather than a weakness. And I also think if you look at beyond the economics of it, if you look at, again, arrest propensity, if you look at some of their marketing deals, these players have done very well as a collective group. And they are small, and they comprise a very small percentage of NBA players. But to me, that's a deduction that that's a positive. In terms of the externalities and the Knicks being young and that the NBA may prefer to have a better team in New York and those types of issues. I think, you know, one is that if that's true, and also if the NBA is, so, is as wise as you give it credit to be, then why do so many fans express disgust with the league, right? Why, why has the league become so unpopular in the eyes of many that if this is such a well-run league, then why is it that there's such uh, dismay at the way the game is played, right? There is, there's frequent criticism that the NBA isn't what it, what it used to be. And that if the league is so smart, why does it keep expanding if the talent pool is small? I mean, you know, the, one of the reasons why the, the quality of play isn't as good is because the NBA decides that we're going to have expansion. 
right? 20, 20 years ago, I believe there were 22 teams. There's been an increase of 33% of players, and, and perhaps there just isn't the talent pool. And you would think that a, a league as smart as you've made it out to be would, would be wary of creating a league that's too big for itself. And we saw that with the NHL, arguably. So I, I'm not sure I buy that the NBA is as wise as, as you make it out to be. And also, you mentioned the cigarette smokers, and I think you compared them to the, to the high school players. One difference I would suggest is that there's some evidence of cognitive biases affecting cigarette smokers with optimism bias and the idea that they're aware of a general risk, but for whatever reason, they assume the risk isn't as strong to them. We haven't seen that with NBA players who skip college. There's no evidence of optimism bias from what I can tell. Otherwise, we'd see more players skipping college. So I think the analogy with the cigarette smokers appears to be belied by some of the evidence. Uh, in terms of the marketing and, the, and your characterization of me calling them stupid fans, I wouldn't call them stupid fans. I think, I think NBA fans are, are not stupid, at least not all of them. And I, I think it's important to point out that, yeah, the league absolutely has an interest in seeing itself do well, right? The league has an interest in seeing that the fans do well. But I don't think that addresses the, the question as to why fans are so unhappy with players who skip college when they're not unhappy with all of these other population groups. And I think that may be suggestive of a social policy that is a concern that we should worry about. Sure, it's a small group of players who are affected. Sure, we can look at Sean Livingston and say, too bad. There's one of you, or maybe there's three of you in every class. We have all these other things to worry about. But maybe it's suggestive of something else. Maybe, why is it that we pick out basketball players and football players and treat them so much worse? What does that say about us? To me, that is a concern. That's a concern that I think the court should consider. I know it's a small group, I agree with you, but that doesn't mean they're irrelevant. And that doesn't mean they're emblematic of other issues that are perhaps more troubling. Thank you. Okay, uh, I wanna open this up, uh, but I can't resist noting Tio was under contract, as I noted. It was, to, it to, was uh, an analogy, yeah. right? Yeah, right. Uh, I didn't defend him. In, 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 my, in my legal opinion on that case. Uh, all right, yeah. I just had a question for Professor McCain. Yeah. Um, just to clarify the rule, is the, is the rule that they have to be 20 or 19 or one year yeah. after their high school class graduates? Sure. What exactly is it, the rule? The new rule is that you have to be one year removed from high school, number one, or the class that you would have graduated with. So essentially, it's, for most players, it's 19 years old, although for some it will be 20 because they'll do a postgraduate year. So for most players, again, it's 19 years old, and it's a one-year delay on entering the league. And the idea is that these players, will, most of whom will probably go play in college, although some believe that uh, some of these guys will go play in Europe or in the minors. I don't know if that's true. The, the D League is explicitly set up to yeah. take them. So. My follow-up question would be, you, you seem to express some very sincere alarm at um, what these policies are suggestive of, um, even though they're uh, targeted at a small group of people. Um, I'm just wondering, one, what, what is it suggestive of? And two, um, you know, if they're only delayed one year, you know, Kevin Garnett wouldn't have cost himself $100 million. Right. Maybe he would have cost himself $95 million because he would have been able to renegotiate that contract that age 21 or 22, 23, instead of 25, 26, 27, if he had gone four years of college. So. Yeah, let me answer the second question first about the, the one-year delay being not as significant. You're right. The one-year delay is not as significant if the NBA had a three-year rule, like in college, right, where you have to be out for three years. Uh, nevertheless, the one year is still important. Some players will go to college and blow out their knee. We've seen that. Some players are in financial situations where they really need the money. Right. A lot of these guys are not from families that many of us grew up in. These players are from very impoverished conditions where one year may actually mean a lot to these particular persons. And I also think it doesn't address the fact that there's, again, the fairness issue, that there's the normative question of why are we postponing their ability to earn an income when these players have done so well coming right out of high school. In terms of the first question about what's it emblematic of, that's an open-ended question, and I'm not going to posit an answer that I can say with great conviction. Some have posited race, frankly. If we look at players in the NBA and the NFL, it's no question that the players most affected by an age floor in those particular leagues are African-American. 
whereas in baseball and in hockey, tennis, golf, entertainment, the same actors don't tend to be in as large number, as large a percentage of African Americans. So, is it race? I don't know. I don't. I don't think it's explicit racism. I don't think the NBA is racist per se, but I think it's suggestive of the fact that. It says something about us that we let this go on, right? Maybe we're just not as concerned because we don't identify with the particular persons who are affected. Maybe Sean Livingston just doesn't strike us as somebody we can relate to. Maybe if it were a hockey player from a suburb of Boston, we would suddenly think, wait a second, I, I can sort of relate with that guy, right? I don't know. You know, there's no, there's no particular answer on that. There's no, certainly there's no empirical evidence to prove a point, but it does invite the question. Just to clarify, the empirical test is to compare Kevin Garnett had he not gone to college and Kevin Garnett had he gone to college. Now, one of those scenarios did not happen, so it's yeah, it's unobservable. But that's how you use the that's how you use the the instrumental variables to really understand that. You know, what would Carlos Boozer have done had he not gone to college versus had he gone to college? There's a very good argument that he would not have done nearly as well. It was some character building that he did while he was here. There was some personal growth. There was some leadership. And that's really what you have to ask yourself. Kobe Bryant. What would Kobe Bryant have done had he gone to college? Had he you know, been under the mentorship and the instruction of Mike Krzyzewski for a couple of years? Uh, he probably would have missed out on a year or two of a very lucrative contract. He probably would also be a little bit more of a responsible person. Certainly that's better for the NBA, but that arguably, possibly might have been better for him as well. That is the that's the correct examination. Okay, can I cut? Carlos Boozer, he made the right decision. And again, it was his decision, right? Nobody said you had to go to college. Nobody said you had to go play and get the moral teachings that you may get from a coach who's cognizant of those factors. He made the right decision. No one can step back in time and say he made a mistake. Kobe Bryant, however, was the poster boy for the NBA for a while. He was a volunteer at the yeah, Los anymore. Angeles. Well, he isn't anymore. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Hold on a second. Okay, if at age 24, he's hailed for doing community service for the Los Angeles Boys and Girls Club, and then two years later, he's arrested for essentially rape, is it, what happened? Was it because we go back in time because he skipped college and that's why he did it? when four years later he was actually hailed as somebody who was precocious, let alone immature. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's about NBA life, right? Maybe it's he was immature. Well, it, well, why was he mature at an earlier age? I didn't say he was mature at an earlier well, age. Well, but he was, but, but, the, <laughs> yeah, but, the, we, but the NBA we, pitched him as so. Right. We, we need right. to <laughs> open this up to the floor. Um, Garnett could not have gone to college. He did not qualify. being, you know, arrested or accused of something, do you think his relationship with Shaquille O'Neal and how he got along with his teammates might have been different had he had more experience in college and seen how that worked? Well, <laughs> you know, that's an open-ended question. I, I would look at some NBA players who did go to college and who didn't get along. Ron Artest, right? I mean, maybe he should have skipped college altogether. Maybe he'd be a better person. I mean, we can keep playing, you know, we can go back in time. We can find a lot of players who don't get along well with teammates. And a lot of them spent a number of years in college. So again, I don't think there's that proof that it was the college experience that would somehow enhance their capacity to get along with teammates. Aaron. You were suggesting that there could be something about uh, the fan base and allowing this to go on. But I think that it overlooks just how, I mean, for example, with hockey, you're right, hockey players go to high schools that let them go to school like one day a week, and then they play in the IHL. And, and, but that's how that market works. And that's what the fans expect to see. And I think that maybe it's just, I mean, you, you want to look for something that, that's there, but it's how the market's always been working. And, and like you were saying with the, with the Knicks, if people stop going, you know, they're going to trade for older people. And, and I, I don't know, it just seems like if it, if it is all based around the income stream, then they're going to get the right people in and out, depending on what people are expecting to see. In hockey, you expect to see 18-year-olds drafted. You hear about them in the IHL as they're coming up. In, in basketball, you hear about them in college. I mean, that's where you hear about these guys and where you grow to attach to them so that when they do go to the pros, you want to see what's going to happen to them. So maybe it's true that there is something else. I don't really know. But it seems like 
what's, what, to me, what's going on in the fans is how we watch the sports is just different depending on the sport. Um, you know, you, you can't really get that attached to a college hockey player because they're not as good as the players who play in the IHL. Right, but I guess the question then becomes, and you may be right, right? We like college basketball typically better, right? It's a more, it's a very popular sport. We like seeing them go to college. We like seeing them stay in college because their teams do better typically. I loved it watching Allen Iverson play at Georgetown. I'll be the first to admit it. But that to me isn't a reason to deny somebody an access to go to a pro league. That just because we like it doesn't address the fact that it's really not fair to them. When they turn around and they look at, as Professor Richmond noted, the players and the, the owners negotiating a rule, right? Negotiating a rule that's clearly not in their interest, and they have a vested interest in not looking out for their interests. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I love watching college basketball. You know, I love it when the teams are good. I love it when the players, I love it when Allen Iverson again. It was great watching him play. But to me, just because I like it and I know my friends like it isn't a reason to preclude access. Yeah, um, just, this is for uh, Dr. Richmond. Um, first of all, there's no one on the Knicks who, who starts and plays under 21. And so not, this wouldn't really, the fact that they're young has nothing to do with you diss Sir this. Charles. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, maybe, but um, um, but it wouldn't have an effect in the Knicks. And, and if markets are as efficient as as uh, you know you and I believe, then it shouldn't matter whether they're young or old. They'll get the people they need. They'll play, and and they should win. Uh, there's no reason that why they're not winning, except for Isaiah and and, and everyone else. Um, but I guess I guess the question is um, if we have these efficient markets, and, and you have this league that's setting up rules to allow play to, to take place, a lot of competition, and, and, that's, and that's perfectly fine. That's why antitrust gives ex exemptions and exceptions to the, to the normal no, uh, no collusion. But w when they're actually limiting competition and keeping people out of, of playing, which would enhance competition as opposed, I, I guess, by keeping, like allowing them in it would enhance competition. Why are we allowing this exemption from the antitrust law? Well, okay, certainly you're exactly right. Uh, these these rule, these leagues are a bunch of competitors coming together and setting rules, and the consequence of those rules are keeping certain people out. Um, Professor Hagen has a, a very sad story where when the lacrosse league uh, changed the rules regarding the kind of equipment that he could use, that essentially ended his career in lacrosse. And it's tragedy. That's one of the that's, he's one of the people who my heart goes out to. It's it's a sad story. Um, now, but the question is whether or not uh, this leeway. And you're right. Antitrust law does give the leagues leeway to set these rules. In fact, gives them the leeway, or whether whether in fact that leeway will translate into anti-competitive rules. Rules that in fact leave certain people out that would make the league more competitive and the market for entertainment more competitive. And there, I would just much more rather trust. Uh, the, the eggheads in the NBA to figure out exactly what rules they want to set to attract, to create the most desirable product. But, I mean, don't, don't we assume that, that the people that are colluding and set up a cartel are going to limit competition and, and restrict the amount of, of what would be optimal for everybody? Well, for sure, and that, that, that's why, you, uh, that's why there's, there's some certain skepticism, which we discussed before, why current players uh, might not be the most socially minded people to, to set the eligibility rules. Um, that's certainly why uh, we only have, I don't know, 32 teams instead of the socially optimal number might be 40 because the 32 teams then have, uh, by restricting output essentially, can charge super competitive prices. Um, there's a lot of reason out there that w how this, this concept might take place, but I don't think that if, if you trust the league as a profit maximizer, I don't think that restricting eligibility the, for the league, restricting eligibility, would cause any of these competitive problems. Can I cut in for a second about just the, the acumen of the NBA in making decisions, right? I think there is a deference to the fact that it's a league. It has a, it's a joint venture that's pursuing presumably a common interest. But that doesn't really get to the heart of some of the issues that have come up of recent times. Let's take the uh, Chicago Bulls demanding, and all of you remember this, maybe remember this, the Chicago Bulls demanded that Eddie Curry a player on the Bulls take a DNA test as a precondition to a new contract with the team. Now, a DNA test has never been required of any other player in pro sports, or in the NBA, obviously, for that matter. So why is it that the NBA feels so empowered 
to make these types of requisitions on the behalf of players? Or why is it that without explicit collective bargaining, the NBA imposes a dress code, right? I, you know, it's one thing to say the league is smart and it's making decisions for its own best interest. But at the same time, you wonder if it's exploiting some of the biases among fans to detract autonomy away from the players association and particularly the players who are most affected from the collective bargaining process. That's a little bit slightly off topic, but I do think that there's, again, the notion that even if we assume the NBA is so smart, that doesn't mean what it's doing is in the best interest of public policy or even in the best interest of the law. And I think that that's another question that we shouldn't just simply assume that they're rational actors and think that that's okay. sympathetic to your overall point about freedom of the NBA players or, or of high school players to go to college, but if we think that the reason that they do want to go at age 18 is usually to get this second contract and they get their really big payday, has the Players Association considered maybe bargaining away the age limit for a sort of at 27, everybody gets a you know a new contract with no salary cap, or at 28, or some kind of age-based uh, yeah, I, yeah. The, clearly, the, the, by taking, by agreeing to the 19-year-old age floor, effectively 19-year-old age floor, the Players Association got benefits in return, right? That this is part of, this is a trade-off in the collective bargaining process. And part of the trade-off was that the maximum contracts wouldn't go down to the, extent, to the same extent that the NBA owners wanted. There was also a dispute about player contract lengths that was involved. So the Players Association... Uh, and as Professor Richmond noted, has to make trade-offs, right? The idea is that there are certain trade-offs that they have to make in order to consummate a collective bargaining agreement. And an easy trade-off, arguably, is one that doesn't affect players who are voting on the agreement, right? It's player, it's, you know, when, they, when you put an age floor, you're talking about a 16-year-old who we don't know and certainly is not a member of the union. So it seems a lot easier to take his rights and extract them away when you can get rights for existing players, as you alluded to. Yes. Isn't, a, isn't the problem with the NBA is that they don't have uh, a minor league system? Whereas, yes. <laughs> whereas, yeah, yeah. Look, yeah. Yeah. It, it's there in the is, process uh, of being formed. Okay, because whereas in baseball, um, they, recognize, they recognize the talent of these high school players, but everyone admits that they're not, they're not ready for the NBA, they, they can't be ready. They're playing against other high school kids half their size. Why do you think there's no minor league system? Yeah, it's because we already have one. It's called the NCAA, right? We have college basketball, it's, it's a farm system. We like to think of it in different terms. We like to think of it as the student athlete. We like to, I think, romanticize it more often than it actually is. But you know, when the average division one college basketball player spends 40 to 50 hours per week playing games, attending team meetings, traveling, working out, dealing with coaches, whereas the average college student is often precluded from working more than 20 hours per week in a job and sometimes 10 hours. It's very suggestive that there's a disconnect between the experience of a student athlete, particularly one playing for a marquee basketball team, and a student at that same institution. I think the NBA has its minor league system. See, but they are and claim ownership of them early right. earlier on where yeah. okay but let's 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 keep with that for one second or do you want to jump in? i don't want to uh, i was just gonna yeah. say that i i think the argument of college basketball as a minor league system works against the argument uh, how much of the how much of the profits generated by college basketball does the nba see i mean directly none they don't own college basketball so you would think that if college basketball were a desirable thing that did generate a lot of revenue you would think that the NBA, and the NBA had the opportunity to capture on that, the NBA would reduce the eligibility requirements. But they don't. And I think it's because there's a reason. I think because the product they get after the college experience is better. Yeah, well, just to... Don't you know, is that, does it work against the argument? I think it depends upon how you look at it. If the NBA teams believe that these players will not immediately be able to contribute, or that they're somehow less marketable, and that we're going to require them, again, this goes back to what we're allowing these persons to do, we're going to essentially require them to play in college basketball because there's no alternative to the NBA, then I think it goes back to player autonomy, and I think then it goes back to the idea that we're bargaining away their rights, which isn't a good thing. I think you can look at, you can look at that coin on both sides. Um, and in terms of 
are these players more draftable after playing in college? Sure, common sense tells us that. But did common sense tell uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers to draft Trajan Langdon after four years of college? Or bo the Boston Celtics to draft Marcus Banks? Or when Ed O'Bannon was drafted? I mean, we can find a long list of players who spent three or four years in college, who did really well in college, who scouts loved, and were awful in the NBA. So the idea that somehow by exposing them to the college game that we're going to make ourselves smarter as a league is belied by the fact that so many of them haven't done well. It's not about age. Age is a proxy. Don't forget that. Age is a proxy. Age tells us certain assumptions that we have about certain people. Think about voting, right? Got to be 18 to vote. Why is that? I bet you all know people who are younger than 18 who are very precocious, who you would say, I wish this person was voting. And then I bet you all know people who are older than 18 who you don't want anywhere near a voting ballot, right? But we use a proxy, age. We say 18, that's the cutoff, because it tells us certain things. But if age isn't a good proxy, then why use it? I went off your, I went way off your question. <laughs> I mean, the proxy is attached to the idea that they're playing against high school competition. That's, right. that's what 18 is attached to. But why have it, okay, that's true. They are playing against high school competition. But why is it that so few decide to go to the NBA and the ones that have, have have done so well? That even if we do have the problem of competition. I'm saying the ones, the ones that have done so well could have even done better. The NBA is not, is not an ideal training ground for them. Right. Yeah, we're right. Yeah, they could have done better, but they could have also the NBA, blown out their knee. I mean, you know. I'm, I'm saying it would be better <laughs> if they had the, a minor league system where the NBA teams could claim ownership of them and they could develop their skills Similar, similar, and, similar to and there is a D league. The, 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 if you want the ideal case for no minor league, it's football, because really there is no other game. Um, okay. Um, other questions. You know, I think there are a couple things that have come out of this uh, discussion, and um, one, uh, going back to to my initial point, Professor McCann has, uh, with all of the, um, the problems uh, that Professor Richmond identified, done a very effective job of puncturing the balloon of the Dick Vitale rant. That is, that the evidence, insofar as we can control, is that the market is pretty efficient at identifying the young kids who are ready to play. Uh, and that they do succeed at a disproportionate rate. Uh, they succeed in the league. Uh, they succeed in making the league. I think we have to take that as a given. We then are operating against another set of questions. One of them is the antitrust question. To what degree is it appropriate under a rule of reason analysis or in deference to collective bargaining to allow these restrictions to come in and to limit the freedom of action of players who could, maybe they would be better, but at least have uh, a choice. Um, and then we have sort of skirted around a variety of other issues, not the core antitrust, um, which at least in the short term has been pretty firmly decided that the non-statutory labor exemption does apply if you get collective bargaining. Uh, again, whether it should, I don't know, but um, uh, it does apply, and these restrictions can be can pass antitrust scrutiny. But we've also seen a number of other issues raised. Uh, is this appropriate for other reasons? Should there be restrictions on league behavior outside of antitrust? Uh, to protect this admittedly extremely small group of players. Uh, I think a number of things have been suggested. We haven't tackled them very directly, um, whether it's out of history, whether it's out of marketing. Um, you know, I think there's a good deal of uncertainty. But uh, we had a very spirited presentation, and I want to thank you both uh, for engaging each other and engaging the topic, and thank you for engaging the collective. Thank you.